Bruchem Aboyim. Thank you for coming. We are now on the third lecture of marriage, again, which is no surprise. Uh, marriage is a intricate relationship, and uh, it's hard to deal with it in just a lecture or two. What creates success in marriage? What, what marriage? What creates difficulties in marriage? And it's interesting that the Rambam tells us that with everything that we do in life, we should always take the middle road. And that's the way to be successful. Meander a little to the left, a little to the right. You're still on track, except for two things. Rambam says a person should never get angry and a person should always be humble. So it's interesting, they're really connected. When you get, why does a person get angry? Because of his ego. You did that to me. And that becomes the difficulty. We see also that God, our goal in life is to really emulate God. To do what God does, to be godly. And we see that God shows us right at the beginning of the Torah that he's given us, his humility. And that the third word in the beginning of the book of Genesis, Bereshus, in Hebrew, Bereshus bar Elohim. We say that God created in the beginning because it makes sense. But if you translate it literally, Bereshus is in the beginning created God. That God put his name third to show his humility. And if God is humble, who are we to be arrogant? Arrogant about what? Our, we are nothing compared to God, and yet God is humble. The most problems in marriage come because of ego, which leads to anger. And then the second thing really is communication. How we communicate, or a lack of it. What's interesting is there's only two things in life you have to be perfect at. One is religion person is religious, that means he's perfect, which is, of course, not the case. Noah was called a, a tzaddik, a righteous individual and perfect. And we know that the flood is attributed to Noah. Noah was not a perfect person in reality, but he was a tzaddik. He was righteous. So you don't have to be perfect to be righteous. In fact, it says that a tzaddik is someone who falls seven times but gets up. That's who a tzaddik is. And in fact, a person who is a repentant person called the Baal Tshuva, is even greater than a tzaddik. I mean, you learn nothing from success. You learn a whole lot from failure. Picking yourself up, continuing to struggle in life, that's what it's about. And also in marriage. So the two things that you have to be perfect at is religion and marriage, which is ludicrous. So if you're married to someone, they make one mistake. You said something that wasn't true, I can never trust you. That's ridiculous. You know, if you look at sports, especially baseball, someone misses the ball twice, hits it once, he makes a fortune and goes to the Hall of Fame. But he missed it more than he hit it. But that's the reality. If you have a 333 life average, batting average, you're a great player. In marriage, we expect our spouse to be perfect even though we are not perfect. We accept our faults, our deficiencies, and yet we expect someone else to be perfect, which has no logic to it. We really, it's a shame that we don't, we're not friends with our spouses. Because one of the things that allows you to be a friend with someone is accepting their shortcomings. Now, he's late all the time. And you're not aggravated. You kind of know that's who he is. You lie to him or do whatever. But it doesn't aggravate you the way it does with a spouse. That we expect this perfection and we take it personal. Like they're created this deficiency in themselves because they want to aggravate me, which is insane. If we look at marriage, as we look at our friends and give someone the benefit of the doubt, if we look at the whole person, I have a friend who uh, was talking about his wife. She's a warm person and she has other deficiencies. But when he was talking about the fact that she's warm and giving and she'll do anything he wants and really treats him in certain ways very well, he poo-poos that because he has that. That's not important. He wants what he doesn't have, which is what all of us have. We forget to look at the assets, and all we look at is the deficits. No one can stand up to that. So 
it becomes important in marriage to look at things realistically. When a person, their ego gets in the way and they, it's all about you. Why is this happening to me? Instead of looking past things, there's a thing I once saw that says every day there's two things you shouldn't say. You don't have to answer everything. You don't have to deal with everything. I mean, in business we don't. If you have a client and you want to sell them something, you don't criticize his personality while you're trying to sell him something. You put up with what he has to say. You find ways around it. And it's really not what's done. It's who does it. Two people can do the exact same thing to you. And one person you'll smile and kind of chuckle about. And the other person you'll get very angry. So it's not what is done. It's who does it. So we need to look especially at a spouse, someone who is so close to us, that's been custom made, chosen for us, and see them in a positive way and laugh it off. And if anything, work together to make things better for both of you, that both of you become better. And that gets us to the point of communication. If you don't talk in a, in a relationship, you have no relationship. Man is called, by terminology in Hebrew, a medaber, one who speaks. Because what makes us unique in the world is the fact that we can communicate with another person. And there's no greater need for that communication than in marriage. To share our thoughts, to share our hopes, to share our dreams, to share our laughter and share our tears. That's what it's about. To have a true partner. What's a true friend? A true friend is not someone you can have a good time with. A true friend is someone you can open yourself up and be honest with. Someone who knows you and you can tell something to and know that they'll understand, that they'll help, that they won't judge you. They're there to help you. And that becomes the key. And when we communicate, especially to a spouse, it's not only what you say, it's how you say it, the tone that you use, and the body language. You know, a person rolls their eyes when you're saying something, and you haven't even finished saying it, already it's negated. Because it changes the whole atmosphere of what's going on. So learning to be not only a good talker, but more important than anything else, a good listener. To let a person finish what they have to say, to not prejudge what's going on. To communicate. You know, many times when you, when you get angry, then the communication is not communication. It's really trying to win. You want your point, and sometimes that well, the way you win is being louder. And it's not about truth. If anything, many times in an argument, a person tries to hurt the other person because all they want to do is win. It's not about finding truth. In reality, that's what it should be. It should be, regardless whether you're right or I'm right, what is the right answer? And together, hopefully, we can find it. But, you know, it's like grabbing a hot pot. You only take grab a hot pot if it's an emergency. Otherwise, you hold that hot pot. If you grab it and then hold it, it will burn you. So if a person's having difficulty, especially with the spouse, but with anyone, if you don't have to pick that pot up, wait. If you can wait till the next day or even longer, great. Because when it's cold, you can hold that pot forever. Then people listen. Then all of a sudden, you're able to make your point. You know, you can never begin a sentence, I know you're not going to like this. Because you're already preparing an argument. Of course they're not going to like it. How can you say that? It says in the Torah, you should surely rebuke your, 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 your people. And I always think that has to do with, of course, any relationship, but especially husband and wife. Because they just keep coming at each other. But it's okay to talk about things that are different and try to make your relationship better. But you need to think it through before you say something. Think about it first, then come up with some kind of criticism. And try... You don't want it to sound like you're criticizing all the time. Even in, even in it being a boss, being a parent, if all you do is criticize, no one's going to listen to you. If you want to criticize, compliment. You should compliment twice as much as you criticize. And then a person wants to hear what you have to say. But if everything out of your mouth is criticism, then who wants to hear it? You know, I always compare our Yetzirah, our evil inclination, to the devil. The devil to a vampire. 
that there are many things that we think inside of us in darkness that make sense. But when it comes out to the light of day, and even when we hear it ourselves, we realize how false it is. So you need to communicate to someone else, you need to articulate what's inside of you to see whether it can withstand the brightness of day, to see if it holds water. Not just, and not only that, when we don't communicate, we start to think what the other person's thinking. And when we put their th their, our thoughts into their mind, so to speak, of what they must be thinking, it's always the worst. And it's amazing that when you talk to someone, somehow it works out. Especially if you're trying to find a middle ground. That, that, that comes together just by talking. That we see with the, our, our forefathers, Avram, Yitzhak, and Yaakov. That when God, Sarah, when Sarah tells Yaakov, uh, Avram Avinu to send Yishmael away, God says, Shema Bakola, listen to her voice. It doesn't say listen to, listen, to, listen to what she's saying in the sense of follow what she's saying. Just listen to her. Communicate with her. So we see that there was communication between Avram Bino and Sarah. With Yaakov. When God tells him to leave Lovin's house, he calls his wife's wives out to the field. And even though God told him to leave, he tells them all the reasons why he should leave. He doesn't even mention that God said so. He tries to give them the logic. He communicates them. He makes them part of the process. And it works. In fact, the one time that they did not communicate, when they leave and Rachel takes her father's idols, she does not tell Yaakov. No communication for seven days. And when Lovin comes, he says, anyone who has it should be cursed and die. And sure enough, she dies. Because of a lack of communication. But the communication between Yaakov and his wives works so well that we see that Avramavinu, his two sons, Yishmael and Yitzchak, both were righteous. We see that with Yaakov, his 12 sons were all righteous. Communication. Rivka and Yitzchak, they never communicated. Never. And because of that, Asa was went off track. Had they have communicated, had they come together and discussed what it needed to be, it may well have been that Asa would have been a different and better person. And even when she communicated with Yitzhak about Yaakov, she lies to him in the sense she only tells him part of the reason that she didn't want him not to marry the, of the women that were in the neighborhood. That's why she sends him to Lovin's house. Instead of telling Yitzhak the truth, she was never genuine with him. And because of that, the children suffer. Parents, fam families need to have that open communication. But not without intellect, not without thinking about it. Before you speak, a person needs to think. It's a shame that what we do many times is we talk, and then we think about what we said. You know, this is all based like on Lush and Hara. There was a man who spoke about another man, and the man died. And he went to a rabbi and asked him, how can, I, how can I repent for this? The rabbi said, well, I'll tell you what you do. Go home and take a down pillow with, with, with uh, goose feathers and lay a path from your house to mine. And when you've done that, turn around, pick up all those feathers, put them back into the pillowcase. And when you've done that, you'll be forgiven. The man said, that's it? The rabbi said, that's it. And that's what he did. He went home, opened up a pillow, took all the feathers, laid a path to the rabbi's house. And when he turned around, in his horror, he saw the wind was blowing the feathers all over the place, and he really could not retrieve them. And he ran to the rabbi, and he says, Rabbi, I can't put the feathers back in. The wind has moved them all over. The rabbi said, exactly. Once you say something, you can't take it back. Think before you speak. And give your spouse the benefit of the doubt. There's a reason why you two are together, for both of you to grow. You need to share the laughter and the tears with a lack of ego, with a lack of anger, with a true desire to respect each other and love each other in a very special way because the only person in your family that you choose is your spouse. And always remember that. It's a part of you. And just like you're not going to hurt yourself, don't hurt them. And God bless you. And again, God, you give us strength to be successful in our endeavors. Have a great job.